please welcome Steve Earle. How are you, man? Hey, good to right. see you again. Good to see you. Welcome back. It was a blast out there, man. It was believe. fun. Yeah. It's one of these. Uh, yeah, it's one of these moments. Just uh, just before when Steve was walking in, uh, Stephen Bowers here. Paul I haven't seen Steve Bauer since we knew each other in L.A. and uh, in another lifetime. So the low highway it comes out of something real. It's not just something poetic. You, you're, you're traveling across America. You're shooting Tremaine in New Orleans. Well, hopefully it's, it's somewhat poetic because it's sort of my job. But um, I, uh, yeah, it's, it suddenly occurred to me. I, I wanted to make a record with this band, which is the best band I've ever had. So I kept writing songs and writing on the road and looking out the window and suddenly I, it occurred to me that I was seeing something way closer to what Woody Guthrie saw for the first time. Like this job I do was invented by Bob Dylan in when he was sort of inventing himself more or less in Woody Guthrie's image. And so all of us that have done the job since Bob have um, done it with some connection, kind of one foot in the 1930s in the Great Depression. But it's it's... You know, the fact of the matter is none of us, including Bob, ever witnessed that firsthand. And suddenly I went, oh my God, what I'm seeing out there is pretty close to what Woody Guthrie saw. These are really genuinely hard times out there. I don't know what the difference between a recession and a depression is. I, I know that there are a lot of people out of work and, um, you know, I, you become very appreciative of the people that come out and pay to see you yeah. play in times like this. Let's play this clip here. Let's go back a little bit. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Ha! <clears throat> Love yourself some, brother. And then drag your sorry ass to some meetings. <laughs> meetings? What the f*** you want to hear? That you're strong enough to do this by yourself? Getting clean's the easy part. Now comes life. So that's the greatest TV show ever made, in my opinion. A lot of people believe that, and, and trust me, way more people know who I am, you know, when I walk down the street everywhere in the world because I was on The Wire than anything else I've ever done. I'm glad you didn't show the beginning of that scene because you would have seen one of the last pictures of me smoking a cigarette because I quit smoking right after that, and, yeah. and I smoked, and I smoked, I think, I think what cured me of smoking finally once and for all was the like 50 or 60 cigarettes that I smoked shooting that scene because I started it out with a cigarette, then you're toast. Then you got to smoke a cigarette for continuity, you know, purposes for the, the you know, every, every take. But it's, uh, it's one of those things. I, the, and, and some of the damage from, to my lungs wasn't just from cigarettes. I also smoked crack cocaine and heroin for a long time, which means I smoked a lot of tin foil and a lot of chore boy, you know, the screens that they use in pipes. That stuff, it's metal and it vaporizes and it's, uh, I've got some pretty bad scarring in my lungs from that. I didn't quit smoking cigarettes until seven or eight years ago. I, I've been clean for 18 years and it was, it was harder to quit smoking cigarettes than anything else. So if you've quit, stay quit, man. It's easier to do that than it is to try to do the whole thing all over again. It was, uh, it's, it was tough. People who have the job, the job that you do, and it's not that music is a job for you, but the, what's the job in that, by that definition? The job's empathy. The job is not the part of my experience. People don't really care that I'm riding around on a bus that costs more in their house. What they care, and especially if I'm feeling sorry for myself about it, <laughs> they, they, um, they think what I do is really glamorous, and it is. But I do do like, it very much aware that there's an audience out there, and mean? I'm trying to reach them. You like, are, you are you talking about certainly people who stereotypically are connected to country music, even though you're more than a country, you're, you do all kinds. But are you talking about I that audience? I was right there on a rail years ago. I haven't been played on a country station in the United States since 1987. Because so. of stuff you said or stuff you did? No, because what I did, I think they knew I was trouble even before I started saying, or before they figured out I was saying stuff. I was kind of always saying stuff. Um, you know, it, it was different in Canada. There, I think there were a lot of reasons for that, um, some of which have changed. Um, the Canadian content rule at radio made country stations when they started in Canada have to widen the definition of what was country. So they played Gordon Lightfoot and they played Neil Young and they played, some, which is debatable about whether you know Neil's uh, Canadian or country. So it's it's uh, oh, he's been Canadian. in California for a long time. Oh, I know. he's Canadian. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I know, but. Yeah. Who's 
that young kid. Looks a lot like Justin. It's kind of scary. Looks like something, but it's you. It's you. Yeah, uh, it's me. 1978, what, 75? Is that Heartworm Highway? 75, yeah. Uh, it was Christmas in 1975. Okay. So I was 20. Um, when you see that kid, what do you think? Um, you know, I, it shocks me more to see him, you know, the guy in the monitor there, than it does to see him. I mean, I think everybody um, always looks like they did then, you know, when they look in the mirror in some ways. I mean, when I, I have to look in the mirror to see the person that I look like now. When I'm not, when I get away from a mirror, I, I, I see that guy, you know, to this day. <laughs> it's one of those things I just... And, it's, and I'm okay with that. I think that's exactly the way it's supposed to be, and I'll, I'll start worrying about myself when I don't anymore. What's fatherhood like for you now? Different, yeah. because, and, and you know, this is one of the most heartbreaking things for me, is my two, my oldest and my middle son, Justin and Ian, would not, you know, Justin up until would have never known what a crack pipe looked like if he and Ian hadn't gotten together trying to throw all my pipes out at one point. And pipes and syringes and, and a whole drawer full of drug paraphernalia that they decided if they threw all that stuff out that I wouldn't get high anymore. Yeah. And they're, you know, that's only, only kids can think that way. And, and uh, you know, I, have, I, I live with all that for the rest of my life. How's John Henry? John Henry's um, beautiful and uh, smart. He has autism. And uh, he was diagnosed just before his second birthday, which was a little over a year. He turned, um, he turned three last week. But he's, uh, he's going to be okay. And uh, we got to figure this out. This is one, and they revised the numbers again week before last. This is one in 50 children are being diagnosed with this. And the rate for boys is higher than girls, and we don't know why. Now, think about that. That's... That's way beyond the AIDS epidemic. It's way beyond the influenza epidemic in, 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 uh, during World War I. It's, it's, and it's pandemic. It's all over the world. Um, it's obviously environmental. It's too large a group of people to be just a genetic fluke. Um, you were a, a gun guy for a long time. Has your position changed? It has, right? Oh, it changed a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. It changed when Justin was 14. He moved into my house, and he... Uh, he like, uh, I had a pistol under my bed loaded and he found it within a week after moving back into my house. And a nine millimeter pistol, full clip, and he hit it and he would not tell me where it was. And I didn't know what to do. And um, I knew he was lying. I still know when he's lying. And uh, <laughs> I just, I searched the place, couldn't find it. So I finally, um, I had my brother come over, we strip searched him, yeah. drove him out to a wilderness camp, they call it, this place where people send their kids when they can't control them anymore, and they're, I'm pretty sure they're hiring them out for slave labor to the state parks department, but <laughs> not proud of it, you know, but it, I didn't know what else to do, and I, and I dropped him off and wrote him a check, and then about 4.30 the next morning, it was January, and it got pretty cold, and they're out there sleeping in the tents, and Justin called me and told me where the gun was, and... <laughs> Was I haven't had a gun in my house ever since. It was behind the shower. He'd, he'd like actually knocked a hole in the wall down low and put it behind the shower shell in his bathroom, and I just didn't see the hole. And, 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 and you're blessed, man, because you, as you know this, yourself included, a lot of people try to keep you alive. And you know what? Thank God, because the record's amazing. And it, like, like any good record in this genre, it is sort of a newscast in a way of how people feel and what they're going through, and you're going to find it on this one. What a real pleasure. Thanks. Good to see you, man. See you, man. Yeah,